Welcome to Our Voices. I am Simani Sheikh Oya and I am joined by my colleagues Orian Itangishaka and Amina Aliyu. Today we will be exploring prevalence of adolescent pregnancy in Sub-Saharan Africa. Ladies, adolescence is the age group between 10 and 19 and recently we are seeing reports that there is a high rate of teenage pregnancy in the continent. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the factors associated with it? Orian, let me start with you. Uh, thank you, Lily. And I think um, uh, there are so many factors, but I want to stick with the lack of communication that continues to be in very conservative communities, conservative countries, uh, because of religion, because of um, uh, culture. And I think that that's something that we still need to continue to work on as a continent. I also think that um, one of the other thing is that the support that the young women get uh, don't get when they become pregnant uh, because uh, I think once they become pregnant they get double crucified for what just happened to them by not receiving the support that they need and they repeat the same um, actions by falling pregnant once again so I think communication at the end of the day is very important. Major problem. And Amina what do you think? Certainly. Well see for me I understand what Oriana is saying and I agree with you Oriana but when I look at my own target area and I look at the aftermath of say Boko Haram and their activities and neighboring countries like Niger and other terrorist activities going there I would say the primary the primary cause at, in this particular time at this juncture would be conflict and that's one of the aftermaths of conflict because what happens right people have to move they leave their households they leave their community they don't have they're not gainfully employed they have to be dependent so refugee situations creates idle hands mm -hmm. and sometimes people are just bored and you seek comfort you know sometimes yeah. when, when life gets really mm -hmm. really hard right. you seek physical type of comfort and this is going to be one of the aftermaths right. yeah. and, and let's not forget yeah. poverty of exactly. course yeah. poverty is also we we the the weaponizing, big one. weaponizing poverty in yes. Africa mm -hmm. with what, what, what we see in a lot of countries, I would say that they've weaponized poverty because when you take away anything that's going to secure investment, you take away everything that's going to secure mm -hmm. stability and mm -hmm. there's no work, right. what else is going to happen? Yeah. 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 So these are the issues we'll be talking about today. Teenage pregnancy is a global issue. Also globally, adolescent birth rate has decreased. Sub-Saharan Africa continues to account for twice the global average. World Vision International estimates that nearly 1 million girls across Sub-Saharan Africa may not return to school due to pregnancy during the COVID-19 school closures. Maternal mortality is also high among teenagers due to their increased risk of medical complications. On this week's episode of Our Voices, we will look at Africa's high adolescent birth rates and the risk associated with it. We'll hear from teen mothers about their challenges and ask experts the steps that need to be taken to increase girls' awareness about their sexual and reproductive health. Teenage pregnancy has long plagued South Africa, affecting tens of thousands of girls each year. Educators say the lack of sex education and counselling is fueling the problem, causing many girls to drop out of school while prolonging the cycle of poverty. Abby Sun explains. Serena Parker's life was suddenly thrown in chaos when she became pregnant. The thought of balancing her education with being a mother at the age of 15 led to panic. Now 17 and mother to another child, Serena, who lives in East Johannesburg Township of Tembesa, says she would not have known what to do without her family's support. Without my parents' support, I wouldn't be here. Because most of the time they're the ones who helps me in making decisions, in do, doing all the duties, parental duties whenever I'm unavailable. So they having my back and they make me have more knowledge and what to do when I encounter such situations. Like many girls in her situation, Paka continued to go to school while pregnant and have been able to continue her education. Her mother Rebecca says at first she struggled with news of Serena's pregnancy, but now she's focused on the future. I was so angry a lot because I was uh, looking something different about Serena, not for the baby right now. But all in all, I used to counsel myself, no, it's done, it's done. Let me uh, stood up with her. 
According to South African government, more than 90,000 births between April 2021 and March 2022 were from teen mothers. Actual figures may be even higher as not all births are registered. Many South Africans still consider sexual and reproductive health a taboo topic. Some parents are resisting the introduction of sexual education in schools, according to educators. The communities were not happy with, um, with that. And we are seeing the consequences of not having sexuality education is the high rate of teenage pregnancy. Serena has managed to stay in school thanks to her mother's encouragement. She now says she understands that her primary responsibility to secure future for herself and for her children. Abhisan VOA News, Washington. As we saw, being getting pregnant at the age, at the teenage, like 10 and between 10 and 19, it's, um, it affects, it, the, affect, the challenges are so many. It affects their physical, their emotional, um, their, even their future. And having uh, over 90,000 girls getting pregnant, teenagers, in one year, it's a very alarming rate. It is, 100%. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, teenagers also need to know, as the, we heard the mother say how much it hurt her, they also need to know the impact and how it reflects on the parents when a young woman becomes pregnant. Yes, the mother says she wanted to focus on the future, but, you know, it does really impact the parents' you know, image and, you know, just way of looking at things when, you know, their child becomes pregnant. So I think something for teenagers to reflect on. And you also have to deal with the stigma of society, not just on that person that gets pregnant, but also on the family and as the a family whole. And the society. And I mean, it's also, it's going to be a challenge for a country because Definitely. losing a manpower, a future of one child affects the whole uh, country at the But I must say, I commend the fact that she still stayed in school. That's right. And I commend her mother more because That's if she right. didn't get that support, there's no way that she would have been able to continue with her education. Precisely. Yeah. I mean, I think it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Things happen in life and we have to be able to move forward and move on and be able to support uh, those young women who go through those kind of challenges in life because they're still smart, they're still very ambitious, and they still have a future ahead of them. Now, the rate of teenage pregnancy in Africa, just like in any other parts of the world, varies country by country. Uh, the contributing factors, including poverty, child marriage, peer pressure, and lack of access to sexual education is, is many challenges. However, the reproductive health and the effects on the teenagers are common across the continent. To learn more about these determinants uh, of teenage pregnancy and the risk associated with it, we invited Dr. Jeanette Hukani, uh, Deputy Director of Pathfinder International in Burkina Faso and co-founder of the Women in Global Health Benin. Dr. Hukarni, welcome to Our Voices. It's such a pleasure to have you. Dr. Jeanette, can you hear me? Thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you. Uh, now we're going to begin with the prevalence that you see um, in terms of teenage pregnancy in Burkina Faso or in the region in West Africa or maybe uh, the continent at large. Why? Well, um, you've said it right, early pregnancy among adolescents is indeed a public health issue because it does carry major health risks and, and social impact. And although, uh, like we are, you have said, we have seen um, globally a decline in um, adolescent birth rate, but in some regions, especially in South Southern Africa, we still continue to have the highest rate of adolescent uh, birth. Uh, now, coming to the main driver of such situation, first of all, I think in many settings in Africa, girls are under pressure to get married and bear children. You know, just giving an example of Burkina Faso, where I live currently, in the region that carry the highest frequency of early childbearing, 14 percent of women um, are married before the age of 15. So imagine you get married at 15. In this society where fertility is seen as, you know, one of the greatest achievements for women, the pressure to get pregnant is, is so unbearable. Mm. I think secondly, a child marriage also plays girl at increased risk of pregnancy because girls who are married um, very early, typically they don't, they have very limited autonomy to influence, you know, decision making about their own body and, and health. 
And I think we cannot talk about teen pregnancy and avoid the child abuse issue, which is very critical right now, especially with the ever-growing security concern that we are having in the region right now. And those, those abuses are deeply rooted in gender inequality. Another main factor uh, that is contributing to the teen pregnancy is the high unmet need uh, for family planning, for contraception. We, you, we, we know cultural names that, that reward high fertility limits demand for contraception among young girls. And in many settings in Africa, contraception are not easily accessible for, for many adolescents for, for various reasons. And sometimes they just lack the agency, or they lack the resources, or they lack information or where and how to get access to contraception. But I think on top of that, there is also a big portion of stigma here. Mm. Stigma at community level, but also from health providers that carries bias. And by doing so, they also limit access to, to services for those young people. So finally, I think, so study yeah. also review. Can you hear me? Yes, we, we can hear you. I'm just really eager to ask you the next question. Which is, Thank we've you. talked a lot, we've talked a lot about child marriage and conflict and all these things that that contribute to teenage pregnancy. So my thing is, right now, this is our reality. And we can talk about ideals from now till the end of time. It's not going to change our current reality. In what ways do you think we can walk around the traditional structures of education to make sure that these girls are also included in having successful education in such a way that they can contribute to society? Because I'm a firm believer in it's really difficult to kind of change people's mindset. You have to systematically um, weed something, you have to systematically remove something out of, out of the society. So I feel as though if we find a way to educate these girls, eventually the need for, 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 teen, for child marriage is going to go away by itself. So how do you think that we can achieve that? Uh, yes, I think there is globally right now a very uh, a consensus on some evidence-based action that is needed to prevent teen pregnancy. And we have witnessed a growing uh, global, regional, and national commitment toward preventing child marriage and ending pregnancy. I think, first and foremost, like comprehensive sexuality education, it has been shown to be an effective strategy on increasing adolescent knowledge and improving the attitude related to sexual and reproductive health. But we need to be cautious for those CSE programs because the ability to assess uh, sexuality education is often based on being in school. While the most marginalized adolescents who are the, the most at risk of adverse sexual and reproductive health outcome are often the least likely to be in school. So we must make sure that we have programs that speak both to in and out of school young girl and boy. Now coming again back to the child marriage issues that I think we can address that by addressing gender inequality, especially through programs that target young boys. Like you said, we cannot just change people's mind over, overnight. But I think we, we can target young boys at very early stage as, as much as possible to increase the chance, you know, to break and challenge those gender norms. In my country, there is a say that, you know, dry wood is difficult to bend. So it's better to, uh, to do it when it's still fresh, it's still soft, so you increase your chance of shaping it the way you want it. So that's mm -hmm. exactly what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Adolescence is a window of opportunity to actually start challenging those negative norms so that in the long term we can be able to tackle the issue around gender inequality mm -hmm. and subsequently also address some of those issues. Mm -hmm. Since we talked about culture and religion as one of, as factors that contribute to teen pregnancy, um, we, I, I feel like we should include also parents and the community in this education system. So how can we deliver those educations into the adults? Because child marriage decisions are made by parents. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, so how, even open communication, when we say that, it involves parents. So how do we include them and make sure that the larger community is also educated? Yeah, I think most Sometimes, yeah, many parents actually do want to speak with, with the children about 
sexuality, but they just don't know how to do it, you know? So that's one piece that we can touch on. Start having, like, I know in, in many countries in Western Central Africa, you have father's club, you have mother's club, many programs that are addressing such issue by educating the <coughs> parent themselves so that they can be able, they have the comfort, they have the ability, they have all the knowledge that they can have to be able to start discussing the, with the young boy, young girl at very early stage. So having those type of programs that, that only include young women, young boys, but also the parent at the same time, it's something that we should invest on if really we want to, you know, mm -hmm. to look at the whole, to have a holistic approach in mm -hmm. tackling uh, adolescent and uh, teen oh. pregnancy. Right. You know, ladies, and, and, and what Dr. Hukarni just said that really stuck with me was the pressure to get pregnant or the pressure to have children in, in the child marriage. It's so hurtful to hear. Uh, Dr. Hukani, do you have hope that that can change in our society, especially in those societies that think that a 15-year-old is ready to be a wife and a mother? I think it's a long-run uh, battle. Uh, it's a long-run battle, and we have seen so many societies uh, where things, there is a debut of change, you know, because, like I said, uh, social norms are very rooted, very deep, you know, and it doesn't change the... Uh, over time. So we have to make sure that in any program that we are putting in place, we work to challenge those norms. It's not just about addressing the issue of child marriage or, you know, the pressure on women and girls, but it's looking at the root cause. You know, we tend to have programs that is one size fits all. And that's the issue, that's the problem. We can't just apply one, you know, one sort of uh, uh, um, action to everything. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that we have a very good analysis of the root cause mm -hmm. and then go deep and address those root cause. By doing that, yes, I think that we do hope, have hope that in the long run, we will be able at some point to be breaking those, you know, those negative norms and also using positive norms because norms are not, are not just negative. They are in community where there are positive norms, you know. So we must find a way to, you know, to work on those positives while we are challenging, we are making sure that we are breaking <coughs> the negative norms. That is a good point to end our conversation with. That was Dr. Jeanette Hanikan, director, Deputy Director of Pathfinder International in Burkina Faso. Thank you for joining us. It's now Thank time... You. Yes, it's now time for a break, but first we want to remind you of our social media platforms. We are on Facebook at VOA Africa and our Instagram and Twitter handle is VOA Our Voices. We are also on WhatsApp and our number is country code plus one two oh two five oh three nine zero two five. We'll be right back. Welcome back and you're watching Our Voices. Today we are talking about the prevalence of teen pregnancy and ways to prevent it. Experts say the best way to help teen teenagers avoid pregnancy is to have open communication with them about sexuality and reproductive health. We talked to teenage mothers in South Africa to find out how much they knew about reproductive health before getting pregnant and the challenges they faced. Let's hear what they had to say. It's not easy. It's like as I'm talking now, I don't have a job, and I have twins, a boy and a girl, and it's not easy. I don't have food in the table, and I must wait for the family members to come and help me. <laughs> I thought that I couldn't give birth because, like, I um, like I didn't go in periods like every month. I could go in periods like, like maybe January, maybe I skip. I go June, 
maybe I could go three times a year on my pillow. So I, I didn't think that I, <laughs> I could make babies. There's disadvantages because you know you have friends like girls. Their parents they start advising them that don't work with that one because if she's like that then you also be like that. So your all friends will go away from you. Yeah, I, I think there's so many ways to fall into the trap of teenage pregnancy. It can happen to any teenagers who's sexually active, but um, the second one, second young lady who's just spoke, she says she her, her period was so irregular that she didn't think she could get pregnant. Exactly. So we this go back to the lack of information and lack of knowledge you know, that needs to really be instilled in teenagers in terms of sex education. Like, she's like, I didn't think I could get pregnant. Like, you know, Ariad, I, I was listening to the same young lady and I was thinking to myself, we need to do a show exclusively on the misconceptions of like African we society don't do that. We don't do and that. around reproductive health. You yeah. will hear the craziest things. I had a show once on my, on my house, a show, yeah. and somebody was saying that, um, oh, she, she got pregnant because she thought the condom was invisible. Oh wow! <laughs> that, they told her. That he told wow. her it was an invisible condom. She actually believed. Wow! That that it, that that was a thing. So mis misunderstanding, misconception, misinformation, lack of knowledge. I think even the third girl we heard from, she said how um, her friends abandoned her because uh, she was pregnant. She thought that her, the parents of her friends thought she would be a bad example. This also comes from misunderstanding what um, this issue is. Um, yeah. Ladies, let me invoke something as well. I mean, I know their lack of information can also be, you know, a, a, a negative aspect of things, but there is also those who are misbehaving. I mean, let's be honest. You see 14, 15, 16-year-olds in the club, and they're in the club with people who are 30, who can lie to them about just anything. So I think that even uh, behavior is also something that people need to begin to really address I because this, society's moral values are declining. But, but this is when you come back to the you issue know, of open communication. Yes, because so these are the things parents, you did, maybe, from, with parents, but with also teachers, with, teenagers with who, religious leaders. These are all responsible. Parents they do their best. But Although, I think also young people looking for scapegoats. They oh, need to do I their best. No, I, uh, so here's the thing, Oriane. I've had so many people say, but it was only once. So I right. believe that even though, yes, people are misbehaving, yes, uh, morals are decaying, yes, they, they I believe hard. all of that. Mm -hmm. But seriously, the lack of education, when you, when you really have to say, oh, right. but it was only once, that really makes me worry about right. how much you know. And it makes me also question, hmm, how much do I actually really know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you are at that age, you are at the age of trying, when you want to try, you want to explore things, so you will be exposed to things. When you are exposed, what do you do? How do you take care? And how I, do you take precautions? And when you have the responsibilities so to talk to their parents about what they don't know about. Uh, Ariane, tell me honestly, honestly, would you have spoken to your mother? Back when you were in Burundi, would, would you have looked at your mother in her eyes? You have an auntie, you have a sister, you have somebody in the community that you that's can why, ask. That's why we say it's not just the one person, but right. it's a collective effort right. to teach um, teenagers about sexuality and reproductive health. And some countries are taking important steps to prevent teenage pregnancy by providing access to education. Kenya's health ministry says sex education digital services launched to help brain in the country's teenage pregnancy problem have attracted more than five thousand youths. Nenana Binti, which means speak with a sister in Swahili, gives information and counseling on reproductive health by mobile application and a toll-free number to Kenyan teenagers who have the world's third highest rate of pregnancy. Victoria Amunga reports from Nairobi, Kenya. Kenya's recent national data shows that one in five teenager girls is a mother by the age of 19. The country ranks third worldwide in teenage pregnancy. Aid groups are trying to help by providing sex education digitally. One mobile application called Nena Nabinti, which means speak with a sister in Swahili, provides teenagers extensive information on reproduction, health and direct interaction with professionals and counselors remotely. It also provides a phone number for app users. Janet Awino is among at least 5,000 young people using the platforms, especially for family planning education. I speak with a person that I cannot see, and that helps me be open. You can't speak with just anyone. Some people can't keep secrets. 
Virginia Mushira, a mother of one, says she could have benefited from the reproductive information such apps provide. My mom and dad were not the type to teach me about these things. We would meet at the table to eat and everyone goes their own way. They would talk about other things, but not about reproduction. They wouldn't tell me. A September 2022 study by Kenya's Ministry of Health found that a lack of information on reproductive health contributed to a surge in teenage pregnancies. Experts say many teens are afraid to speak with their family about sex and reproduction, and having access to such information can go a long way to remedy this. A lot of the clients who call, if they are adolescents 10 to 17, they want to know more about menstruation. Others call knowing, uh, work, uh, inquiring on uh, safe days. Others call wanting to know the effects of contraceptive. State authorities say they are training young people in communities to assist in programs that benefit young mothers. Some want to go back to school, so we take them back to school. Others say they cannot continue with school, so we give them skills. Some are also taught about employability and starting a business. Kenya's Ministry of Health adopted a 10-year national reproductive health policy in July that seeks, among other things, to address adolescents and young adults' reproductive health. Authorities hope that such initiatives as Nena Nabinti will boost efforts to control teenage pregnancies in the coming years. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. <laughs> See, now I feel cheated. Mm. Why, didn't I have this? Why didn't I have this when I was growing up? Right, I so know. now teenagers have no excuse because not only they have a mobile app, for those who have those phones who yes. can carry those mobile apps, but they also have toll-free numbers. If you're not able to have a conversation with mom and dad or auntie, you have a toll-free number. So I think there are resources. Yes, mm -hmm. and this is a positive thing to work on. And mm -hmm. we can continue the conversation on our social media platforms, but that's our show for today. We will see you again next week with another exciting program. Please continue the conversation on our social media platforms. Until then, thanks for watching. <laughs>